that black mud came from the East Beach. And they would slather that stuff on, and they would go lay in the sun, bake that mud on, and then go back out to the lake and wash it off by just bobbing around in the water. On the West Beach, there was green mud. It's a kind of a very light sea foam kind of green and it turned a little bit on the green gray color so if you wanted colorful people <laughs> maybe they came from mars <laughs> little tiny lake very rare but what we can learn from this lake is enormous and could have and may have significant impacts on the quality of life of the people of the world <clears throat> not just the people of Grant County or so clear. Truly very important. So we need to learn more about it. We need to understand its implications of what happens around it and what happens in it. And are we indeed using it to receive the greatest benefit? place is home. Why do we stay? When do we go? Is it time? Is it late? Is it true? Why do we wait? Is it what we see or how we feel about a place? Where is home? Do you know? Three months from the day Mount St. Helens blew, I arrived in Soap Lake. Roxy Thorson, the famous queen of the salt mines, was on her porch, sipping port and relaxing in her 1950s steel spring rocker. I didn't have two dimes to rub together. Roxy would say, don't spend your money before you have it saved. The sweet, wet, salt grass smell of Soap Lake was unmistakable. So was the long pause when I asked her for a place to live in exchange for my help around her hotel. So it began, her life and mine, under the same rounded roof sandwiched between rock walls in an almost desert at the end of an ancient river channel. Life was good. This I knew. There's a clean smell here, like after a heavy rain, a hint of sea spray, ancient yet fresh, salty but sweet. Wafered between sunburnt pink paint, thick with the curls of time, was newly discovered warmth in faces enjoying sunny days. Young and old, large and small, some sprawled on blankets and others slathered with mud, all of them relaxed, refreshed. This sun-drenched, almost perfect place is a lost treasure and a forgotten mine, revealed in records lost long ago and faces no longer seen. For 95 years, this rounded rock sentinel gazed upon lives passing by. A witness, do we dare look inside? How inviting is an empty room without ordinary light, or an eye as a window to the past? Footsteps fall in halls left to ponder what these timeless walls can never speak. And if they could, what would they say? Where is home?
do you know? Before the discovery of penicillin and sulfa drugs, Americans imbibed untold potions, homebrewed tinctures, and magic make-you-better elixirs. When we came to this country, my father gave us cod liver oil. He said that that was supposed to prevent colds. He would take the juice of canned peaches, not in water, but in a thick syrup. And he would put the cod liver oil in the syrup. And ever since then, when I see peaches in thick syrup, I get sick. When I, it brings back memories of the cod liver oil. Early in the 20th century, homegrown remedies were the only medicines Americans had, unless they could take a cure at a spa. Spas at Saratoga Springs, New York, White Sulphur, West Virginia, and Hot Springs, Arkansas flourished before the 20th century. Soap Lake in eastern Washington was one of the most well-known mineral spas in the West. This story begins in 1905 when Soap Lake's first sanitarium was built. A sanitarium was a place that provided care for the sick or convalescing. They were almost always located near a mineral spring. The Soap Lake Sanitarium on the southwest shore of the lake offered expert masseurs, bath attendants, and rooms for 10 to $12 a week, including board and baths. In 1907, the Siloam Sanitarium was completed, a first-class three-story hotel. The Siloam sat on a hill to the east with a commanding view of the lake. Financed with investments by O.E. Loving, a well-known sheep herder and his partners, M.R. McMahon and John Rogers, the Siloam became one of the most popular resort hotels in the state. On May 21, 1907, John Rogers wrote the Great Northern Railroad about the success of their hotel, noting that overcrowding had forced him to order tents. Within a year, the Siloam had 100 rooms. In 1908, a room and board at the Siloam cost $18. Continued overcrowding resulted in rules restricting guests to only one soap lake bath per day. Throughout its 15 years of operation, the Siloam became a nationally advertised social center and health resort. Disaster struck the Siloam at 5.50 p.m. on September 1, 1921. While burning weeds around the hotel, the proprietor accidentally ignited the building. Within 30 minutes, the hotel was a smoldering mass of ruins. Nothing was saved. No lives were lost. The owner carried no insurance. The Thomas Sanitarium, built in 1908, was another popular destination. Located on what is now the corner of Maine and Elder, visitors had easy access to an ice cream parlor and pool hall. In early 1911, the Great Northern Railroad established the Soap Lake Station at Grant Orchards. Regularly scheduled train stops increased patronage to the resort. The Lakeview Sanitarium opened on June 23, 1913. Advertised by the owner, George Crow, as strictly first class, 
the Lakeview, like all sanitariums in Soap Lake, provided customers a practicing physician and expert bath attendants. Mr. Crow advertised the Lakeview as a place to visit for the treatment of all skin diseases, stomach and bowel complaints, rheumatism, liver, and kidney illnesses. By 1914, Soap Lake had four good-sized hotels that could accommodate up to 300 people. Newspaper accounts indicate it was not uncommon to see as many tents as there were hotel rooms. Hotel brochures, maps, and Washington State tourist guides referred to Soap Lake as the world's greatest medical marvel, the world's greatest healing spot, and the world's greatest mineral sea. During the summer, sanitariums were overflowing with patients and visitors packed the beaches. Cottages, cabins, apartments, and massage parlors sprang up throughout town. Taking the cure amounted to bathing and swimming in soap lake water, but mud baths were considered the ultimate treatment. O.A. Anderberg began operating his mud bath parlors in 1906 in tents on the southeast edge of the lake. Bathhouses offered lady attendants for female customers. All sanitariums had resident doctors, nurses, and masseurs. Visitors were referred to as patients. Services included mud, steam, and sitz baths, and blanket sweats. In 1910, E. Paul Janes, a well-known real estate salesman, built a large rounded rock building and a salt plant near the lake. In 1911, he launched a full-scale promotional scheme. Janes paid for an official analysis of Soap Lake water from the State College of Washington in Pullman. He began advertising his products as guaranteed under the Pure Food and Drug Act. He established a mail order service and sold Soap Lake products as far away as New York, where drug companies bought them for resale. In 1913, Janes traveled to New York for unknown reasons, and he never returned. Roxy and Ernest Thorson bought the Janes Building in 1913 and took over the production of Soap Lake products. When Mr. Thorson died of pneumonia in 1920, his 26-year-old wife, Roxy, took over the business. She operated Thorson's Hotel and Soap Lake Products Company until she died in 1984. During the summer, Soap Lake was a busy resort community. Guests were entertained on weekends with dancing and masquerade balls and costume parties. One of the most popular places to dance was the McDonald Building. Built in 1914 at a cost of $25,000, it had a swimming pool in the basement and a large wooden dance floor above. The post office, a pool hall, barber shop, and massage parlor were on the first floor. Word of Soap Lake's medicinal qualities and high-flying social life spread rapidly. Hotel guest lists were published in local papers. Visitors came from all over the state of Washington and the country. The Beach Hotel and Sanitarium was built in 1915. 
With its cafe and promenades overlooking the center of town, it was a popular destination. Partially destroyed by fire in 1929, it was reopened in 1937 as the New Beach Hotel and Coffee Shop. Virginia Grove was born in Soap Lake in a house that stood where Rick's 79-cent hamburgers is today. I was born in Soap Lake in 1914 on December the 12th. It was a bitter cold night. There was no doctors in Soap Lake. In 1914, there was no electricity in Soap Lake. I know Mama used to send me down to the store with my little can to get some coal oil to, uh, to uh, put in the lamps. And the uh, storekeeper would always put a potato over the spout, you know, so I wouldn't spill it going home. And uh, then in 1919, a man by the name of Paul Fowler came to Soap Lake and built a building and put a generator in it and produced electricity for the town. Virginia's father, like so many others, came to town seeking treatment from the lake. He uh, had lived in Indiana and he was having a problem with his lungs, like he needed uh, a little salt sea air and sunshine. And his doctor had some kind of an interest in the Siloam Hotel. So he suggested to my dad that he come out west and where the air was clean and healthy and, and uh, pursue his trade. And that's how my dad got to Soap Lake. You can't, you can't imagine how many miracles I've seen that lake do for people. I've seen people come there on stretchers. They stay two or three weeks, get up and walk away. There was, used to be a man that came to the Beach Hotel when I was waiting table there. And he had uh, psoriasis so bad that his fingernails had all turned black. And he came every summer and stayed for three months and bathed and drank the water. And in the fall, he'd go home. He was all clear. You know, most everybody that came there came with an illness. They came there on a shoestring. And when they got well, then they started up a business. Frank Clausen came to Soap Lake in 1915. He came for relief from chronic health problems. He got a job hauling mail from the train station in Grant Orchards to town. All mail, goods, and supplies for Soap Lake came on the train. There were few roads and only a trail between town and Anderberg's mud baths. Frank's brother Paul arrived in 1919. Paul took over the mail route, meeting trains twice a day, seven days a week. He returned to Soap Lake with mail and passengers, some of them so sick they arrived on stretchers. We had people come to Soap Lake on stretchers and they would, uh, they would come in the, in the baggage car. They had to travel in the baggage car. And we had the only one. The transportation was our trucks, so we had to use the trucks and, and bring these patients in. And this would happen that quite, quite a number of times. Paul Clausen, Jr. was born in February 1927. Growing up in a small town during the Depression had its own special charm. Tipping over outhouses was a common practice back in the days when they were plentiful. A fellow named Frenchy had Frenchy's cabins. And uh, he had the outhouses, and he decided that he was going to stop it. He got inside, he was going to catch them. They, he got inside the outhouse. And the boys came and they tipped it over, but they tipped it over so on the door so that Frenchy, he had to crawl out through the <laughs> through the seat openings <laughs> to get out of the outhouse. <laughs> Man, <laughs> you could hear him hollering in there, you know. <laughs> 
Several businesses offered deep-sea baths concocted from water retrieved from the bottom of the lake. Gus Wallen deep-sea baths. And Gus Wallen had the boat, and he would go out in the lake, and he would get the water uh, from the bottom of the lake or deep in the lake and bring it in, and it had a sulfur content. Oh, God, it was something. You could smell that damn thing, but people would take his deep-sea baths. Paul's parents owned the phone company and operated a switchboard. Mom would keep the telephone thing open until midnight. After midnight, we closed down and you could make a telephone call, but there was a surcharge, I think 25 or 50 cents, to make a phone call after midnight. But so Mom would keep the, would stay up till midnight to keep the, keep the switchboard open. Uh, somebody called the sheriff to come in and get you to raid the place for a poker game or something, gambling. And um, by gosh, my mother took care of him. She just called down to Willard and he run the pastime. Willard, uh, somebody's calling the sheriff. You better stop the game. <laughs> and that was the way things went. <laughs> and so like. <laughs> In 1923, when George Waltho was advised to seek treatment at Soap Lake for asthma, he moved to town with his wife, Maggie. They purchased the Argonne Hotel, transforming it to their own popular Waltho Hotel and Sanitarium. A room at the Waltho cost $1.50 a day. George Waltho Jr. was born in 1926. He grew up in Soap Lake, helping his parents run their hotel. In the summertime, I slept outside in a tent because the, room, the hotel was always full of people, and then lots of times they would even rent my tent out on me, so I'd sleep outside on the grass in a sleeping bag or something. It was the same way all over town. All the hotels were full. If, if people just had to have reservations, uh, I mean, they luck out. They might luck out and come in and get a room, but most of the time they'd be smart if they had a reservation so they knew where they were going to go. And my father and Julian Agronoff's father used to go out to the railroad depot every day and pick up people and bring them into town. Of course, the railroad stopped out there where Grand Orchards is today. And that was the Soap Lake Depot. But the West Beach in the summertime, it was just about impossible sometimes to go down there and find a place to lay down on the sand. There were so many people there. And they, they, they would lay out in that sun and just some of them get burned to a crisp, including myself. George, like others who grew up in Soap Lake, saw the results of Soap Lake water on visitors who came to town for treatment. I've seen people come that stayed in our hotel that, that they had eczema so bad. It was terrible. I mean, uh, I used to try to have to help mom and dad try and clean rooms and that when I was growing up. And I kind of was a little chambermaid, I guess you might call me. And some of the poor folks, and it was always mostly old men that had the problem. They had it so bad that they would scratch themselves so bad that when you went to make the bed in the morning, it looked just like a fish had been scales. There were scales all over the bed and in the bed and everything, so they had to be cleaned each day. But if those people stayed there a while and took the treatments and got in the soap lake water, they couldn't just jump in. They had to keep it fairly mild to start with or it would just, they'd feel like they were burning up. But if they took it gradually and took the baths, and some of them went to other parts of town, took mud baths, if they'd done it like in a very slow sort of way and stayed with it, eventually it was amazing how many of them would clear that up. No one was a stronger supporter of Soap Lake than George's mother, Maggie. Maggie Waltho was appointed mayor in 1946. She was described as a person with a heart as big and mellow as a watermelon and a tongue that could cajole a councilman or tear off his hide. Maggie was Irish, and she was proud of her town. Anybody that needed help, mother would 
do anything she could do to help them. And as many, many times that the poor people that were out, the fellas hitchhiking or didn't have a bite to eat or couldn't have, didn't have money to buy anything, they'd come to the back door, knock on the door, and then mom would answer it, and they would ask her if there was anything they could do so they could, she would give them something to eat. And she always found some little thing for them to do so they felt like they were earning their dinner. Nude bathing in Soap Lake was a tradition. On the west side of the lake over there that actually they ran around all day long with nothing on. You had a women's section and you had a men's section. And they did not go back and forth together. It was strictly men and women. And they were left alone and uh, I never ever heard any, never did hear of any problems. In 1947, when the Grant County Sheriff tried to enforce a ban on nudity, Maggie led the city council to a unanimous vote blocking interference of the nudist by the sheriff. By the 1930s, Soap Lake had numerous hotels, stores, restaurants, a bakery, a newsstand, a bowling alley, and a theater. In 1937, movie house baron John Lee from nearby Ephrata bought the Sunset Theater and changed it to the Lake Theater. John Lee bought out the, the theater there in Soap Lake, and I was a little brat, I guess you call it that. Uh, I had a, not a pet snake, but I had a bull snake. And I went down there in front of the theater and this is the summertime, and I had that damn snake, and I made like I was going to buy a ticket. But I didn't buy a ticket, and I stood around out there, and people refused to go into the theater when I had that, when I had that snake there, afraid I was going in there with that snake. And it was a fair long, like this, you know. <laughs> and, uh, and finally, uh, John Lee came out and just gave me hell, and I argued with him. I said, look, this is a public sidewalk. I said, it's public sidewalk. I can be here anytime. I'm not hurting anybody. And I, this is a public sidewalk, and I have a right to be here. And you can't kick me off. I really stood up to him. My first legal argument, and I won the argument, but I lost the war because he went up the street. And they went to see my mom. We only lived a half a block. And, and boy, Junior, get up here. <laughs> well, I had to go home, and that took care of that. <laughs> Jack and Pearl Coberly came to Soap Lake in 1904. Jack sought relief from severe psoriasis. He set to work building one of the few rounded rock buildings still standing in Soap Lake. Known then as the Coberly Apartments, it had six rooms upstairs, three downstairs, along with a barber shop, doctor's office, and a bathhouse. Their daughter, Betty, was born in 1922. Betty grew up watching Soap Lake grow and change. She remembers the Coberly Apartments. We had the apartment house with the barber shop in front and the bathhouse, great big bathtub, so people went in and rented, paid for a bath of Soap Lake water. And it was really a popular place because the tubs were so nice and big. We didn't have the uh, any toilets inside in those days, even our apartment house. You had to go out behind the apartment house on the back, uh, back of the apartment house, and they had a men's and a ladies' restroom there. And the way it didn't freeze, when you sat down on the seat, it would flush. When you got up, it would quit flushing. And we had that in our back, off our porch, and we had it off of the apartment porches. And it, that was quite an invention in those days, because we didn't have no heat in them, so... Must have worked. When Jack Coberly died in 1923, his wife's father, Cap Jeanette, moved to Soap Lake to help his daughter raise the children. Cap, short for captain, had spent most of his life at sea and couldn't imagine life without a boat. He started up a small business, charging a few bits for a boat trip around the lake. For years, there were walkways with platforms built from the shore into the lake. At Elliot's place on the West Beach, you could rent a bathing suit and a locker, buy a soft drink, 
or play a song on the jukebox. And you could go in there and they had little cubby holes. You go in and rent a suit and change your clothes. Then they had a big walkway out, clear out to the lake. But they'd had some beautiful pavilions down there and walkways, great big long wooden walkways out. We're swimming right underneath them. Then out past that, they had a big tower where you could swim out to and dive off of. So I've done that, but you sure couldn't swim out to it now because it's practically dry ground. <laughs> Joyce Pinkerton was born in 1922. She remembers what Soap Lake was like when she was growing up. We had one neon sign, James Cafe, I always remember it. And from the top of the hill, I thought that was the most beautiful sign. It was only light that you could see down there that, you know, had any color or anything in it. And, uh, you know, you didn't have the sidewalks and the gravel road. And, you know, uh, we although when they did... Uh, Black Tablet, we used to take our sleds and uh, slide down that in the winter, all winter long, right, you know, Main Street. But there wasn't that much traffic. And, of course, you knew everybody that owned anything in town, you know, it was Delancey's and, and uh, uh, Coberly's and, and the bakery and uh, the Malin Hotel, which is not there anymore either, and then... Uh, uh, the church, and then my folks is uh, a meat market. And, uh, you know, and that, then further up was the Finney Garage. Well, there, there were so many people, lot, they, if they didn't make reservations, they wouldn't be able to stay in Soap Lake because all the, you know, the places that uh, uh, rented to tourists, they were always full. New Beach Hotel in the summertime was always lots of people there. Uh, people always out walking after dark, you know. It's nice It's nice out there walking. And uh, uh, going to the beach, sitting down at the beach after dark. And uh, that just seemed to be their life. People that come here on vacation. The sudsy thick foam that forms along the shores of Soap Lake is legendary. Stories have been told about clumps of foam as big as a car blowing across the road along the east side of the lake. No one knows what causes the white suds to appear after a stiff north wind has blown across the lake. It would beat against the rocks, and then it would really foam. And it was beautiful. Especially at night when the lights hit it, you know, it was just really pretty. Richard Bontheus was born in a house in Soap Lake in 1923. His fondest memories were visiting the Indians who came every spring to dig roots. I'm afraid to come right down the street and go right up to that there, uh, right behind where Sam Ezreal's trees are, kind of a valley there. The first thing to do is dig out a place there close to the lake, fresh water there, and uh, water their horses and drink the water, them use whatever potable water they needed. Richard's father, Case Bontheus, operated a market and dry goods store on Main Street. It was a popular place for children who grew up to remember the 50-gallon barrels of pickles, peanut butter, and sauerkraut sold by the pound in Mr. Bontheus's Soap Lake Market. When Lewis Agronoff came to Soap Lake in 1919, he began building the Lewis Hotel and Sanitarium. Located next to the Sunset Theater and a few blocks from the lake and a dance pavilion, the Lewis Hotel was very popular, especially with the Jewish community. In 1938, Gregor Agronoff arrived to help his father with the hotel. His son Julian was 11 years old when they arrived. Of course, I was the kid from the big city, and I still had, you know, I had pointed toe shoes, which were the fad at that point, at least for kids. And so uh, they enrolled me in the Soap Lake School, which was a three-room school. As a kid from out of town, uh, I had to prove myself. And uh, so the, the school bully and I got into it right off the bat. 
and uh, naturally I got beat up, but that was beside the point. <laughs> but being a summer resort, you know, everybody had to make it within the, in, in three months, roughly, June, July, and August, because by, July, by uh, Labor Day, the season was over. Running a hotel in a busy resort town during the summer was not easy. I can remember in the summertime, this was before air conditioning. It used to get so hot. My folks at the back of the hotel had a long porch that went the full length of the hotel. People would drag their mattresses off their beds and everybody slept outside on the porch. It was really kind of, a, it was kind of funny. But it was to the point where if you didn't call in for a reservation two or three months ahead of time, you didn't get a room in Soap Lake. I mean, period. There just was nothing available. People would be sleeping in bathtubs and on the ground and under trees and everywhere just until something opened up. It was, it was wild, but it was a good life. The hotel itself was built in 1919 out of concrete blocks that my grandfather cast one by one. And uh, in 1927, the year I was born, he moved the old Johnson Hotel from Ephrata to Soap Lake. They wouldn't give him a moving permit, but he moved it anyway and ultimately re rebuilt seven miles of highway because the thing was so heavy that it just kind of gouged the, the blacktop. And so he joined that part of the old Johnson Hotel to what he had built to create what was then the Lewis Hotel. In 1932, the federal government granted $15,000 for a study on the effects of soap lake water on the treatment of Berger's disease. Berger's disease was an incurable circulatory disorder that affected hundreds of World War I veterans. Victims of the disease would experience excruciating pain as nerves were exposed around gangrenous lesions. Amputation was the only relief. When the word got around in veterans' publications that Soap Lake offered a cure for the disease, veterans arrived from all over the country. Sam Diamond had Berger's disease. His left leg was amputated. When his doctors told him his right leg would also have to be removed, he hitchhiked from his home in New York to Soap Lake. He wore out a pair of crutch tips and a shoe on the journey. It was through the tireless efforts of Berger's victim, Earl McKay, that enough attention was attracted to the veterans' cause that the state of Washington appropriated $100,000 to build a veterans' hospital in Soap Lake for the research and treatment of Berger's disease. The hospital was dedicated on November 11, 1938, in honor of Earl McKay, who died two months before the event. Bill Castle was 25 years old when he came to Soap Lake in 1938. Although he was not a war veteran, he was one of the first patients treated for Berger's disease at the new hospital. Well, it was amazing, and I was ready to have my leg taken off in one week, and three days later, I was in soap, in soap lake, and in four or five days, that toe had begun to heal up. Four or five months, I was walking on it again. There was a definite improvement in a short time when I went follow the treatments, which was simply bathing it every day and periodically a full bath in the soap lake water. In 1940, one out of every 18 residents in Soap Lake had Berger's disease. When I, when I was there, I've seen as many as 150 Berger's disease. 
victims in, in town. That's more than most doctors have seen in their lifetime. Joyce Bender came to Soap Lake in 1934 in response to an opening for a waitress job at the James Cafe. She met George Noteras, who operated a boarding house and restaurant across the street from the James. They got married, and Joyce raised their six children while helping her husband manage the hotel. You did not stand around. If there was nobody in the place, you had a pan of water and a rag and you were washing something. He says, don't let anyone look in the window and see that you're not busy. He says, no one is to see you not busy. And he did, he wanted that of all of his help. He said, if you're not busy, they won't come in. And he was right, you know. But you wash those booths so many times you thought you were going to wash the paint off of them and the tables and the chairs and the glasses and the dishes. And you didn't work any eight hours. You had more than an eight-hour day. But you had your room and board and a buck and that and a few nickel tips. So you got along all right. First year, we rented a three seventy-five a week with a little wood stove you could cook on and a bed. No water in the cabin, you had to carry your water. No bathroom, you had to go out to the bathroom. No shower, there was a shower in the yard that you could use. Then it went up to four, and then it went up to five, and during this time, there was no linoleum at the floors at the beginning. I used to scrub wood floors to make them clean for the people to move into. And then by the time they move out, be grease around the stove and you'd have to do the scrubbing over again. When the signpost out there said 259 people in town, that's how many people there was during the winter. It could go up to 3,000 during the summer when there was tourists here. And they came then for the Soap Lake baths and for the Soap Lake water. In 1935, State Highway 17 was blasted through basalt bluffs along the east side of the lake, allowing motorists to pass Soap Lake for freshwater destinations further north. The little resort town nestled at the south end of the Lower Grand Coulee in the middle of prime farmland would surrender its isolation. By the late 1940s, construction of the Columbia Basin Irrigation Project was underway. Seepage from irrigation canals constructed along the sides of Soap Lake introduced fresh water into the lake and threatened shoreline homes with flooding. In 1956, the Bureau of Reclamation installed wells at several locations around the lake to intercept fresh water which townspeople feared would dilute the mineral qualities of the lake. America's prosperous post-war families traveled in automobiles to an increasing number of newly popular resort destinations theme parks, and federal and state-designated recreation areas. Advances in medical practices and the development of hundreds of patented drugs changed health care practices in this country forever. The days of lunchbox socials, taffy pulls, pinochle parties, masquerade balls, and shoulder-to-shoulder -shoulder foot traffic on the streets of Soap Lake slowly came to an end. It has been almost a hundred years since the first hotel attracted visitors to the shores of the lake. If ever a place could mirror its own past, reflecting them in old photographs, lost treasures, or simply still waters, Soap Lake is a treasure to cherish.
I remember Southern Sun parades, and I have a picture somewhere of me dressed up as little Bo Peep, and Mom and Dad borrowed a little black lamb, and I walked through the parade with that lamb dragging me from one end of the street to the other. And there's a picture of me looking rather cross, <laughs> but I think I won first prize. It was a wonderful place to grow up in Soap Lake in the 60s. Uh, the lake was just a block away from my home. When school was out, my shoes vanished and my hair grew long and curly and, and wild. Two never took our bathing suits off till it was time to go to bed. When you got up in the morning, you put your bathing suit on. You didn't put a pair of shoes on until it was time to go back to school. I always felt very, very fortunate that I grew up here, uh, in the home that I grew up in, in the town that I grew up in, and uh, to have gone to school here and to just have lived here because I, uh, I moved away from here to a very large city. I moved away from here to Chicago, and, and they never had the kind of life I had when I talked to them. They never had the freedom I had, and they never had the fun I had. Dad used to have that old gray pickup, and any time we went any place, everybody could bring one friend. Well, you take two times seven, that's 14 kids in the back of that pickup going to Apple Blossom Festival or uh, just going out to Park Lake to spend the day. Dad was good about, about taking us to those places, and we just had fun just had a good time and that's what is special to me is to grow up with that kind of freedom and not being afraid to walk down the street. And we would have the teachers over to our house for dinner and we would go to their house for dinner. I mean, you see, at that time in a small town, there was this closeness, this wonderful closeness. Soap Lake is a place that brings people together, year after year, time after time. Visitors often return with their children, who come back later with their own children, one generation after the next. And people came from all across the United States. We had a professor, two professors, husband and wife from Connecticut, who came every year for 20, 25 years just for that water, and they love Soap Lake. Um, we had Mrs. Cullerton from Seattle, who um, brought actually over the years four generations of family. Um, so there are many people. In fact, my son right now lives in one of those rentals um, where my folks were for many years. And he delights in the fact that people will walk by his front porch in the evening and ask, you know, do you, do you remember Mrs. Lanigan or Mr. Lanigan? We used to rent from them 30 or 40 years ago, and he would proudly say, you know, I am their grandson. Soap Lake is tuned to the hum of a distant sound, not so much that of a drummer. It's a wail, long and slow. It can be heard coming from across the water. I knew from the moment I stood on the beach looking north towards the stunning basalt formations thrust skyward along the west rim of the lower Grand Coulee that this was my home. Until that day, my eyes had never known exhaustion, exhaustion from trying to explore countless nooks and crannies that exuded mystery, shadows, color, and constantly changing plays of light along ancient and cracked flanks, begging to be explored. Beneath these cliffs, as if to double their timeless visage, a tiny lake reflecting in pairs what my eyes wanted even more of. This tiny, holy, prehistoric reservoir created through centuries of leaching groundwater became unpretentious host to decades of human suffering. A place at peace with itself. This lake is a vessel, and as such, signifies the feminine. Today, she lay belly up to the sky, lounging in rock-heeled boots and salty overcoat, dug in and doing what she does best, reflecting us as we pass by. Where is home? Do you know?
I feel nurtured here. I feel calm, happy. I feel like the soap lake water just rejuvenates me for the rest of the year. And I, my happiest times are coming here. I've been to Palm Springs, Palm Desert, I like it, but I'm happier here. Soap Lake was a wonderful town to grow up in. You know, you weren't afraid of anybody or anything. You could just walk down the street and everything was just lovely. And of course, we didn't have any sidewalks, but we didn't care. We just walked along in the sand and the gravel and the dust. <laughs>